<laughs> Thank you. My t uh, first, let me uh, ask your, uh, you to excuse the appearance of my face. Uh, it probably looks from where you're sitting like I'm growing a beard, but I'm not. This is bruising and sutures resulting from an unfortunate encounter I had with the pavement a couple of days ago. Uh, my topic today is puncturing the acupuncture myth. This should be fun because I get to be a mythbuster, like uh, on the Mythbuster show on television, uh, Jamie Heineman and Ad Adam Savage. Now, if you've ever watched that show, you know that they like to end their programs by blowing something up. So I want to reassure you that my talk won't involve any explosions. Now, I say reassure you, but some people may be reassured, other people may be disappointed. Anyway, uh, I'd like to start with a taxonomy of pincushions. When we stick pins in dolls, we call it voodoo. When we, <laughs> when we stick pins in babies, we call it child abuse. When we stick pins in prisoners, we call it torture. And when we stick pins in patients, we call it alternative medicine. <laughs> now, an acupuncturist might say it was a jab well done. Acupuncture is probably one of the most popular forms of alternative medicine, but there really is no such thing as alternative medicine. There's only medicine that has been tested and proven to work and medicine that hasn't. And if anything in alternative medicine had been really tested and proven to work, we wouldn't be calling it alternative medicine anymore, we'd be calling it medicine. Um, and whenever I say that, someone says, but what about acupuncture? It's been proven to work, hasn't it? Doctors are using it. Uh, it's covered by health insurance plans. The American Air Force is teaching battlefield acupuncture to its doctors. But no, it really hasn't been satisfactorily proven. Um, the studies, um, the, the evidence is weak. It's inconsistent, flawed, and unconvincing. And if you put all the evidence out there together, it is perfectly consistent with exactly what you'd expect to see if you uh, studied a complicated placebo. Now, almost everything you've ever heard about acupuncture is wrong. You've probably heard that it's an ancient Chinese treatment method that involves sticking needles in acupoints. You've heard that it's widely used in China that it works to relieve pain and nausea, that it works for other, in condi other conditions like infertility, <clears throat> that it can be used instead of anesthesia for surgery, that it's harmless, it has no side effects, and that it's been validated by scientific research. Well, every one of those statements is false. Even the description of acupuncture as an ancient Chinese method is false. In fact, every word of that description is false. Ancient, but it's nowhere near as ancient as they'd like you to believe. Uh, Chinese scholars have gone back to the uh, earliest documents and they found that they weren't talking about acupuncture with little needles, they were talking about bloodletting with big needles or lancets. And they weren't going over uh, meridians and acupoints, they were going over blood vessels. Um, and the current practices of acupuncture, what happens when you go to an acupuncturist's office, mostly developed in the 20th century. Um, the, the ear acupuncture, which is what the American Air Force is teaching its doctors, was invented by a Frenchman in 1957. So you might as well say that it was uh, it's a modern French system rather than an ancient Chinese system. And it may not even be Chinese. Um, historians are thinking now that the ideas behind acupuncture may have actually come from ancient Greece and traveled to France over the trade routes. And even calling it a method is wrong because acupuncture is many different methods. When someone talks about acupuncture, the first thing you want to ask is, what do you mean by acupuncture? 
Which acupuncture? Do you mean the kind that uses needles? The kind that uses electricity with or without needles? Do you mean acupressure? Do you mean moxibustion and cupping at acupuncture points? Do you mean the system of acupuncture that implants little gold beads under the skin? Or do you mean the uh, acupuncture of vol, electroacupuncture, which uses a biofeedback machine and a computer, and they put a probe on an acupoint, and the machine tells you what kind of homeopathic remedies you need to take? <laughs> now, if you mean with needles, do you mean needles all over the body or needles just on the ear? Now, the pictures on the right show how ear acupuncture was developed. In 1957, there was a French doctor named Nogier, and he looked at the ear, and he said, you know, that sort of looks like a fetus curled up in its mother's womb. And I've got to say, he has a much better imagination than I do. But um, he, he tried inserting needles in the appropriate point on the ear, if you had a pain in the leg, he would figure out where the fetus's leg would be on the ear and he would insert a needle there. And he convinced himself that it was working. And there are other whole systems of acupuncture that only use points on the scalp, the foot, the hand, or the tongue. Uh, there are probably over 30 different kinds of acupuncture, some of them with skin penetration, and some of them without. Uh, the ones that don't penetrate the skin claim to be stimulating acupoints with every imaginable modality. Light, sound, pressure, heat, electricity, electromagnetic frequencies, vacuum, color, and even waving hands over acupoints. Here's one of the non-needle options, color puncture, which is acupuncture with colored lights. They call it esogetic color puncture. It uses colored light, infrared frequencies, ultraviolet frequencies, brainwave frequencies, sound, and crystal treatments as indicated by Curlian energy emission analysis to gently unlock and release emotional trauma and energetic blocks which often underlie our illnesses. And it assists the flow of spirit information in the body. Now, all I can say is if that makes sense to you, you might want to seek professional help. <laughs> And then, uh, some people are injecting homeopathic remedies into the acupoints, which compounds the insanity. They're in injecting a non-existent medicine into non-existent points. Now, we all learned about the water cycle in school. So if, uh, if water has a memory, then water is full of what it says on this poster. <laughs> or homeopathy is full of it. Uh, now, if you, if you want to have fun sometime, Go online and look for a video of Tong Ren. This is an acupuncture method where you take a little doll with the acupuncture meridians marked on it, and you tap it with a hammer. And you can find a video of a whole room of supposedly sane adults standing there holding their little dolls and tapping them with hammers ryth rhythmically in unison. Now, when reality gets that silly, it's hard to tell the difference between reality and a hoax, like the butt reflexology hoax that was published in the <laughs> British Medical Journal. A doctor said that he had found that the entire human anatomy was represented on the buttocks, and it worked better to insult, insert the acupuncture needles there. He actually got invited to speak about this method at an integrative medicine conference, and he had to decline and explain to them that it was a joke. The things that they believed in were so silly that they couldn't tell the difference. Uh, there is a quote from Dr. Who that is apropos here. You know what the difference is between, uh, what, what the trouble is between with distinguishing fantasy from reality? They're both ridiculous. Uh, the elephant here is, the mammoth is saying, that's odd, my neck suddenly feels better. Now, that's a joke, but that's, uh, that is essentially how they say the acupuncture points uh, were originally found. A Chinese warrior had chronic shoulder pain, and when he got wounded in the leg in a battle, his shoulder pain went away. 
And they claim that by observing lots of wounded soldiers, they figured out where all those acupuncture points were. Now, how do you suppose they did that without uh, knowing about the scientific method, without a control group? Um, it never made sense to me, and there's a clue that it was just made up out of whole cloth. Originally, there were 365 acupuncture points, and that was no accident. It was symbolic, it was linked to astrology, uh, and it was meant to represent the 365 days of the year. Well, now there are over 2,000 acupoints. In Korean acupuncture, there are 300 acupoints, but they're all on the hand. And in auricular ear, ear acupuncture, there are only points on the ear. Dr. Nogier started with 30, and now they're up to 120. And uh, when you add up all the acupuncture points and all the different systems of acupuncture, what's left? Is there any point on the skin that's not an acupuncture point in someone's system? Well, yes, there is. Interestingly, none of the systems uses any points on the male genitalia. Um, you got to be kidding, your back still hurts? You, <laughs> you, know, you could just put acupuncture needles everywhere. Now, before you get scandalized, this is not a picture of a naked woman. This isn't even a woman, it's a man in a fat suit with a wig. This is Matt Lucas in the character of Bubbles DeVere on the BBC comedy show, Little Britain. Bumbles has just run out of an acupuncture session to encounter her ex-husband in the lobby of the hotel. Uh, and how many acupuncture meridians are there? Well, you can take your pick because there are, there are ancient texts that say there are nine meridians or 11 or 12. Or is it 14 or 20? They've somehow come up with eight extra meridians during the passage of time. And, of course, some systems disregard the meridians entirely and only use points on the tongue, scalp, ear, or hand. So, <clears throat> this leaves a lot of questions unanswered. How did they determine where the meridians are located, and why can't anatomists find them? Who figured out which acupuncture points did what? What would it take to verify all those correlations today? And even if, if you knew the, where the points were, how reliably could you locate them? Um, during fetal development, we all start with the same body plan, but it gets expressed in different ways. We all have unique fingerprints. Uh, the spinal nerves supply different parts of the skin, and that's variable from person to person. You might find a spot that would be supplied by the fifth cervical vertebra, fifth cervical nerve in one person, and by the sixth cervical nerve in another person. And um, some acupuncturists claim they can verify the acupoints by eliciting a sensation called de chi. But uh, in in studies where no de chi sen symptom is is elicited. Uh, it seems to work just as well, so I'm not sure what that means. Now, I used to get allergy shots, and it, uh, it would be given by the same technician using exactly the same technique. Sometimes it would hurt, and sometimes it would not hurt at all. And I think it was because sometimes it would be close to a skin nerve, and sometimes it would be in between the nerves. So there's, there's so much variability. When you look at the back of your hands, your, the veins on the back of your hands don't even match. So, how reliably do you think an acupuncturist could find those points? I like to practice before I start acupuncture treatment. <laughs> so, with all of that variability, um, I, I don't see how they can be confident that they're hitting the right point. And then there's chi. Chi is a mythical vitalistic force that's alleged to throw, flow through meridians. You can't measure it, you can't even detect it, but it's great stuff. And if, when it gets blocked, it makes you sick. And if you can release the blockage with a needle, it re restores the flow of chi and restores your health. Now, in order to believe that acupuncture really works, you have to accept a lot of unproven assumptions. You have to assume that acupuncture meridians exist, 
that acupuncture points exist, that their location is consistent, that acupuncturists can reliably find those points, that qi exists, that disease is caused by the blockage of qi, that needles somehow affect the flow of qi, and all that somehow improves health. And in order to uh, uh, assume that acupuncture is a placebo, you just have to assume that, uh, that it works as a placebo. Now, it's a myth that acupuncture is widely used in China. It isn't. It was banned in China more than once. It was actually illegal to use it. And Chairman Mao restored it to, to uh, respectability during his barefoot doctor campaign. He couldn't afford to provide scientific medical care to the entire population. So he resurrected traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture to appease the masses. He didn't believe it worked, and he wouldn't use it for himself, but it was okay for the peasants. And today, Western medicine is the standard in China, and acupuncture and traditional Chinese methods are used mainly by the elderly and the poor. It's also a myth that acupuncture can be used for anesthesia. The myth got started in 1971 when Nixon went to China and uh, New York Times journalist James Reston went along. While he was over there, he developed appendicitis. And somehow the myth got started that he had had an appendectomy under acupuncture anesthesia. That wasn't true at all. He had conventional anesthesia for his appendectomy. And he only got acupuncture for post-operative pain, and that was along with re regular pain medication. But the myth spread. You may have seen pictures like this. Uh, this woman is supposedly undergoing open-heart surgery under acupuncture anesthesia. And the first time I looked at this, a couple of things struck me. For, for one thing, it, it doesn't look like the incision is quite in the right place in relation to the position of her head. And the bigger problem is she has an open chest cavity. When you open the chest, the first thing that happens is that air rushes in and atmospheric pressure collapses the lungs, and the patient can't breathe. So where, where is the respirator? Why, how are, I mean, this lady should be dead. <laughs> and acupuncture is used for surgery in China today. But the patients also get local anesthetics and sedatives and narcotics, which do a pretty darn good job all by themselves. And patients are selected by strict criteria, and only about 10% of them are thought to be eligible for, an, for acupuncture. And there's a lot of psychological factors at work. There's strong suggestions, similar to hypnosis. Uh, the patients are motivated to please the authority figures, and often they're afraid of they'll be exiled from their job, home, or family if they don't cooperate. A, a colleague of mine, Kimball Atwood, is an anesthesiologist, and he's investigated acupuncture anesthesia in depth. He says, rather than being an important Chinese achievement, was acupuncture anesthesia more a form of torture? perpetrated by a totalitarian government on its own citizens with the forced complicity of physicians. Now, what about animals? On the plus side, you've cured my back pain. <laughs> uh, they say, oh, it works on animals, so it can't just be a placebo. But it can, too. Animals can't tell you my pain is, uh, has gone from a 6 to a 4 on a scale of 10. Uh, the owners have to interpret the animal's behavior. And um, it may be that animals who have been treated get handled differently. There's conditioning, like Pavlov's dogs. And acupuncture has been shown to release nat natural painkillers or endorphins in animals' brains. But this, that's the same thing that happens when you throw a stick for a dog or when you load a horse into a trailer. Uh, they have acupuncture diagrams for all kinds of animals. Here's goat puncture camel puncture, chicken puncture, even possum puncture. Now, I ask you, how many possums do you think the ancient Chinese studied to figure out where the meridians are? And how do you think they can find the right spots through all that fur? Uh, I didn't put up a picture of, of the horse diagram, but they have a diagram of meridians on a horse that shows the gallbladder meridian, which is interesting because horses don't have gallbladders. 
Okay, so maybe all those explanations about chi and meridians are nonsense, but acupuncture might still work anyway. You're doing something, you're sticking needles into people, so there might be a scientific explanation for it. And they've tried to find one. They've uh, posited neurovascular bundles, trigger points, connective tissue fascial planes, reduced electrical impedance, enhanced migration of nuclear tracers, but all of these studies <clears throat> are inconclusive, they're flawed, they're inadequate descriptions of the acupuncture points or the meridians. They use small sample sizes and they have unexplained statistical analyses. And nowhere do they build study on study to build up a body of, of evidence. The studies uh, get done, they never get replicated or built into a, a solid body of evidence. Uh, other theories have been suggested, the gate theory of pain, counter -irritant, irritant effects, and you can document the release of endorphins in brain imaging studies, but you can get that same release of endorphins if you give someone a sugar pill. Uh, they did a neat study in Japan in 2000. Uh, they had a, a model of pain in mice, and they tried three different methods to block the pain, acupuncture, moxibustion, which is burning mugwort on the skin at acupuncture points, and pinching the mouse's tail with a hemostat. Guess which one worked better? Pinching the tail with a hemostat. <laughs> and acupuncture even works on rubber arms. They've, uh, they've set up a, uh, an illusion with mirrors so that it, it, it looks to the patient like a rubber arm is their own arm. And when you stick an acupuncture needle in the rubber arm, you get the same findings on brain imaging as if you stick a, an acupuncture needle in the patient's own arm. The brain is responding to expectation and to visualization of penetration, and the actual penetration with the needle is unnecessary. Now, the medical letter has looked into the scientific rationales, and they found that acupuncture has been shown to increase endogenous endorphins, but Functional MRI studies show effects on central analgesic pathways, but it's not clear that those same effects couldn't be achieved by needling or electrical stimulation at non-acupoints. My friend Ray Hyman has a categorical directive named after him. Before we try to explain something, we should make sure it actually happened. And by extension, before we try to explain how acupuncture works, we should establish that it does work. Here are all the things that it's supposed to work for. I know you can't read this, but it, everything but the kitchen sink. Now, uh, what, which of these have actually been proven to work by uh, some sort of respectable evidence? Only these two, pain and post-operative nausea and vomiting, and those are still questionable. Uh, now, that's not to say you can't find a study somewhere to support using acupuncture for everything on that list. But in medicine, it isn't enough to find one study. Uh, a doctor named Ioannidis wrote a wonderful paper showing that half of all published studies are wrong. There are 6,500 peer-reviewed scientific journals. It works out to four scientific papers being published every minute of every day. So it's not surprising that you could find a study to back up almost anything you wanted to believe. Now, when a popular but ineffective treatment is studied, false positive results are common for a number of reasons, including bias and low probability. Stephen Novella says that acupuncture proponents have been able to change the rules of clinical research so that essentially negative or worthless studies of acupuncture are presented as positive. Um, you now, recent acupuncture studies with good sham controls have shown that it doesn't matter where you put the needles, it doesn't matter whether you use needles or pretend to use needles. All that matters is whether the patient believes in acupuncture and believes he got the real thing. If you got acupuncture but think you didn't, it won't work. If you don't get acupuncture but think you did, it will work. Um, now, studies have shown that sham acupuncture works the same as real acupuncture. They've done studies with retractable needles in a sheath, uh, kind of like a stage dagger. And they even did one study with toothpicks that showed that just touching the skin with a toothpick worked as well as inserting an acupuncture needle. 
So the acupuncturists saw this result and they said, oh, well, we know acupuncture works, so gee, sham acupuncture must work too. Um, and they found that light touch and caressing the skin can also relieve pain. But that just, just destroys the whole rationale for acupuncture. Instead of all that rigmarole with needles and meridians, why not just give the patient a massage? Uh, there was a study of heartburn where they compared acupuncture to doubling the dose of the heartburn medicine, and they didn't use a control group. And here's their rationale for not using a control group. We did not add a sham acupuncture arm to this study because of the increasing recognition in the acupuncture literature that superficial needling of the skin, sham needling of non-acupuncture points, and placebo needling with blunt tip that does not penetrate the skin, acupuncture, also provide an active therapeutic effect. This is particularly the case in pain. Light touch and caressing may activate the C-tactile afferents that alleviate unpleasantness and reestablish patient's sense of well-being. Therefore, neither minimal superficial sham acupuncture nor placebo needles may be regarded as placebo because they are not inert. Now, wait a minute. There's, there's, there's a double standard here. What if we had a pain pill that didn't work any better than a placebo sugar pill? Would we assume that the sugar pill worked and that it wasn't really a placebo, but it was an effective drug? I don't think so. Um, the results of acupuncture trials are questionable because they don't rule out all the possible confounders, the, the sur surrounding ritual, the beliefs, all the nonspecific effects of treatment, the attention, expectations, suggestion, TLC, relaxation, hands-on treatment, all that has an influence. <clears throat> Here's an example of a questionable study. The CACTUS study was a pragmatic trial that compared usual care to usual care plus acupuncture. It was poorly designed and it didn't use any placebo acupuncture controls. And it concluded that acupuncture worked. Uh, David Cohoon has analyzed this study. I'm, I'm afraid you won't be able to see this on, uh, on the screen very well. But there are four graphs there showing the outcomes from four things they measured in, these, in the study. Um, the pink line is the control group, and the blue line is the acupuncture group. Sometimes the pink is on top, sometimes the blue is on top, and they stay very close together throughout. And David Cahoon said that although the study was de uh, designed to be susceptible to almost every form of bias, it still shows staggeringly small effects. It is the best evidence I've ever seen that not only are needles ineffective, but that placebo effects, if they are there at all, are trivial in size and have no useful benefit. He said this paper was published with conclusions that appear to contradict directly what the data show. Now, there's a place for pragmatic studies because when you do a research study, you want to minimize possible confounders, so you have criteria for accepting su subjects into the study. And they tend to be healthier and on fewer medications than the average person who walks into a doctor's office. So once you've established that something works with a clinical trial, then you want to take it out into a real world setting and see what actually happens in practice. Uh, for instance, clot buster drugs worked really well in the studies, but when people started using them extensively in emergency rooms, they ended up causing more strokes from bleeding complications. And pragmatic trials are not appropriate for complementary and alternative medicine treatments. They're intended to evaluate treatments that have already been proven to work. And pragmatic trials don't provide any objective evidence that a treatment works better than placebo. But CAM ad advocates love pragmatic studies because they allow the placebo effects to shine, they're a way to bypass good science, and they can make CAM look better than it really is. Uh, let's say you do a pragmatic trial of acupuncture versus usual care for low back pain, and acupuncture wins. Have you proved that acupuncture works? No, this is what I like to call Cinderella science. Uh, I'll retell the Cinderella story a little bit. On the left, you see Cinderella in her rags and ashes. On the right, you see her ugly stepsister who's had a complete makeover. She's had her teeth fixed, uh, got contacts, professional hairstyling and makeup, and a designer dress. Now, let's say Cinderella's 
fairy godmother didn't get there in time, and Cinderella had to go to the ball in her rags and ashes. And the prince looked at her and looked at the after stepsister. Well, I think he would probably choose the after stepsister. It wouldn't be a fair comparison unless uh, the rags and ashes Cinderella were compared to the before stepsister or the fairy godmother enhanced Cinderella were compared to the makeover enhanced stepsister. And if you do a pragmatic trial of acupuncture for low back pain, what happens when you get usual care? Well, you go to your doctor's office and he examines you and says, oh yeah, this is just a common variety, garden variety, low back pain. Almost everybody gets this from time to time. We don't really know what causes it, but it usually goes away in a couple of weeks. And if you want, I can give you some pain pills or send you to physical therapy while it's running its course. And he, he may seem rushed, he may act bored, and he may not even ask to see you back for follow-up. And compare that what, to what happens when you go to your friendly acupuncturist. He says, uh, oh yes, I know exactly what's wrong and I can fix it for you. And he goes into a big complicated explanation about yang and yin and chi and meridians and you don't really know what he's talking about, but he sounds very confident, he seems like he's an expert. He takes you in the back room and has you lie down and relax, and he spends a whole half hour with you, up close and personal, hands on. Uh, he talks to you, he sounds really interested in you as a person. He finds out that you get heartburn sometimes, so he says, oh, no problem, we'll just use a couple more needles at this point and that point, and that'll take care of your heartburn too. And when he's through, he doesn't say, uh, are you feeling better? He says, you feel better now, don't you? and you feel a social pressure to agree, and you really do feel better, if only because you've been lying down relaxing for half an hour. And boy, does he want to see you back for follow-up, three times a week for the next month. So I think of usual care as Cinderella's rags and ashes. What you see is what you get. And with acupuncture, if you could use the needles alone, let's say you had a, a computer uh, or a robot that could insert the needles, to get just the specific, specific effects of needles. That would be like the before stepsister. But when you get the whole elaborate rigmarole from the um, acupuncturist, it's like the after stepsister with all, the, all those other uh, aspects of the encounter between the doctor and the provider added. Now, when we look at all the research, there are some studies that show that acupuncture works and others that show it doesn't. So the next step when that happens is to do a systematic review and see which side has the, the most evidence. But that didn't work because there were several systematic reviews that showed it worked, but there were others that showed that it didn't work. So the next obvious step is to do a systematic review of systematic reviews. And Edzard Ernst did exactly that. They found 57 systematic reviews that met their criteria. And the results were a mixture of negative, positive, and inconclusive findings. There were only four conditions for which more than one systematic review reached the same conclusion. In three of those, more than one study agreed that it didn't work. There was only one case where more than one study agreed that it worked, and that was for neck pain. And Ernst goes on to explain how inconsistencies and biases Conflicting conclusions and recent high-quality studies throw doubt on even the most positive reviews. Now, there's a double standard here. Let's say we had a prescription pain pill, and you had 57 systematic reviews, and you did a review like Ernst, and uh, you got the same results that he did. What if this prescription pain pill appeared to relieve pain in the neck, but not pain anywhere else in the body? I think I would be hesitant to prescribe a pill like that. And what about side effects? My headache's gone, but now I've got pins and needles. Uh, they'll tell you there's no side effects and that acupuncture is perfectly safe, but it isn't. There's several hundred published cases of serious adverse effects, including infection, pneumothorax, spinal abscesses, and at least five documented deaths from acupuncture. Uh, there was a, a case where an acupuncture teacher was demonstrating proper technique to a class and he managed to stick a needle into the chest, into the lung, and collapse the patient's lung right in front of all of his students. 
And there are less serious adverse effects in 11% of treatments and one-third of patients. And here are some of the other things that can happen that are less, less serious. You may have seen in the news a few years ago, the ex-president of Korea had to have major surgery to remove a 6.5 centimeter acupuncture needle from his lung. And there are contraindications. You shouldn't have acupuncture if you're allergic to metals, if you have bleeding disorders, if you're on anticoagulant drugs, if you have skin infections. And there's a popular pregnancy book that says uh, don't use acupuncture points on the ankle because it can produce uterine contractions and bring on premature labor. I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, but I do believe that some patients shouldn't have acupuncture. And then some of them will say, well, even if it's only a placebo effect, why not use it anyway? Patients say they feel better. That's what we want. We want people to feel better. Well, in the first place, placebos are unethical. And there is a small possibility of harm for very, very little, if any, benefit. It wastes time and money. It delays or it may result in rejecting effective treatment. And believing false claims leads to rejection of real science, like vaccines. And placebos don't really do very much. Placebo effects tend to be small, and they tend not to last very long. Uh, here's an illustration from a study they did on patients with asthma. Uh, the four columns go from left to right. The left is, uh, they gave them an albuterol inhaler, which is an effective drug for asthma. The second one is a placebo inhaler. The third one is sham acupuncture. And the column on the right was a no intervention control. They got no treatment at all. And the patients felt better. And acupuncturists looked at, or the p people who believed in placebos looked at this and said, well, look, you can give a placebo and it works almost as well as the drug without the risk of side effects from the drug. But that was only when they asked patients how they felt. But the patients weren't really better uh, when they looked at uh, the objective measurement of lung, uh, uh, lung function. Only the albuterol made a difference, and the placebos made no difference at all. There was no difference from the uh, group that got no treatment at all. And this is dangerous, because one of the main uh, reasons for death in asthma is when patient, patients don't recognize how serious an attack they're having. So we don't want patients to just feel better. We want them to actually be better. And we don't even need a placebo object to get a placebo result. They did a study with four groups. Two of them got placebos, two of them didn't. And two of them got positive consultations where the doctor was uh, very positive. He said, well, I'm sure we've got the right diagnosis. I'm sure this is going to work. And the other two got negative consultations where the doctor was more wishy-washy didn't seem as confident about the course of the disease. And both of the groups with positive consultations did better than those with negative ones. And neither group with placebo did better than the groups without placebo. So it's not giving the patient the placebo, or giving the sugar pill, or sticking the needles in the patient. It's the way it's presented to the patient that matters. Now, the Center for Inquiry has looked at acupuncture, and they've come up with a statement. And uh, they, they concluded, the bulk of recent research strongly tends towards the hypothesis that acupuncture's positive effects are mainly due to, to built-in expectation. And the medical letter looked at it in 2006, and they said, acupuncture alone has not been shown in rigorous duplicated studies to benefit any medical condition. Now, enough is enough. When, when a treatment has been extensively studied for decades, like acupuncture has, and the evidence continues to be inconsistent, it becomes more and more likely that the treatment is not truly effective. Now, they always say more studies are needed, but our research money is limited, and there are much better ways to spend it. The bottom line is there is no credible evidence that acupuncture works for anything other than pain and post-operative nausea and vomiting, and it may not really work for those. And any improvement we see with acupuncture is most likely due to the nonspecific contextual treatment effects. It has nothing to do with acupuncture points or needles. Uh, to sum up, acupuncture is a theatrical placebo. Now, I wrote an article about this in Skeptic magazine. And one acupuncturist wrote me an email 
He said, uh, your article about acupuncture made me angry. Uh, I thought that you had to be wrong because I knew there was research. I knew there was evidence, so I went to look it up, and I didn't find it. And in trying to prove you wrong, I proved myself wrong. And I have gradually let go of the belief that acupuncture has any basis for treating anything. And he told me that he was giving up the practice of acupuncture and was going to look for another way to make a living. Now, if it's true, if it's true that laughter is the best medicine, maybe this is the kind of acupuncture we ought to try. <laughs> That's all I've got. Uh, <laughs>